All right. So begins lecture seven, um, which is going to be on metric spaces, and um, this one this one took me a little longer to put together than I thought. Um, so there's uh, there's quite a bit actually in section three point four. Uh, so let's get to it. Um, so first of all, um, definition: a distance on a set X is a function uh, which takes in a pair of uh, you know points in X and um, outputs a real number. And um, this function we call the distance function, provided it satisfies these three axioms, right? Um, the distance has to be non-negative, and the distance between uh, two points is only zero if those in fact are the same point, all right? Um, I tried to find a name for this, but in uh, and I just, <laughs> there doesn't seem to be an agreement. I mean, you'd think this, this property would have a name. I don't know, I couldn't find it. Um, anyway, at least one that was commonly agreed upon in the things I looked at. But uh, this here <clears throat> is the, you know, symmetry of distance. Distance from point A to point B is the same as the distance from point B to point A. And, of course, the, uh, the triangle inequality, which you can kind of see in this picture over here. You know, you heard heuristic picture, um, distance from x to y is less than or equal to the distance from x to z and then the distance from z to y, right? And um, in the examples we're familiar with, of course, if these distances are equal, it means that x, y, and z are along a line. But, um, all right, so here's example one. And um, I'll be referring back to example one a lot in this lecture. It's, it's kind of um, well, it's, it's simple, and, and yet it also really is very abstract. Um, I mean, let's look at it here. So we have a set, <laughs> okay, and um, we define the distance between two points, all right, to be zero if the points are equal, all right? and 1 if the points are not equal, all right? So <laughs> there's only distance 0 or 1 between two points on this, in, in, this, in this metric. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I should mention, sometimes the distance function we also call a metric, and so that's why it's called a metric space. Um, more on that in a bit, but basically a set together with a distance function or metric is called a metric space. But... Um, Anyway, you can run through the axioms of the distance function and see that, <clears throat> indeed, this is symmetric. It is, you know, obviously set up so that it's only zero if the point's the same, if the pair of, if the inputs to the distance function are the same point. It's obviously non-negative by construction. And um, <clears throat> the triangle inequality, well, you just need to think through the cases, you know. Um, if you had three points, then, um, you know, um, either, let's see here. Um, so if you had three points, either X and Y are the same point, which means the distance between them is zero. So of course the distance to another point plus the distance to another point is like either zero and one it's either 0 and 1, or 1 and 0, or 0 and 0. Either way, you've got satisfying the triangle inequality. So you, you just run down the cases and, and, and quickly surmise that example 1 does, in fact, satisfy the triangle inequality. Now, this is um, interesting because this means that any set, right, um, can be given... Whoa, how does that square? Oh... Huh. Interesting. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm getting... I'm getting wrapped up with a question at the end of this lecture, which is concerning the problem of what's called metrizability. We'll come back to that. I just realized the error of my thinking. So we'll, I'll circle back to that at the end of this lecture. Anyway, you can't hear my thoughts, so no harm, no harm done, right? Um, <clears throat> if you can hear my thoughts, this is a really neat camera. Anyway, so let's move on here. So that gives us a way to make any given set 
a, um, a metric space because we can take any set, right? And we can give it this weird 0, 1 distance function, right? And that will make that pair of x comma d a, um, a metric space. As I said in this remark, any, example one applies to any set. Any set can be made into a metric space. However, hmm, perhaps not in an interesting way. So this 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 uh, this right here addresses the thought that I didn't say out loud. <laughs> anyway, here's another example. Um, so a three-point set A B C. So the distance from A to B, the distance from A to C, the distance from B to C is 1 because those are distinct points and otherwise you got distance 0 so like here's a kind of a picture of it a b c and the distance I'm drawing dotted lines with numbers to indicate the distance so that kind of is a diagram of the distances between the sets right um, I made these kind of pictures when I studied graph theory um, a little bit alright let's see here next uh, we could well we could look at a a four-point set, you know? And, oh, in the previous example, I think the distance could could conceivably conform with the Euclidean distance if you put those three points in, like, a plane, you know? But uh, I think here you probably can't make the distance between A, B, C, D um, like Euclidean distance in this context. Not without, not without some funny business, because at least... <clears throat> If I put the points A, B, C, D in like the natural square, I was just thinking about this, then of course I can make the distance between any of the two vertices along the edge like that one, but you know, the Euclidean distance between A and C or between B and D would be the square root of two. And yet, if I use the distance function from example one, I'm by, uh, <clears throat> by force of definition declaring the distance between any two distinct points to be one, all right? So already we see that there doesn't have to be one concept of a distance function on a set, right? Obviously this we could look at as a subset of R2. You could talk about the usual distance function, um, you know, defined by the Euclidean distance like we learned about in middle school. Or you could use the example one distance function and, and they, would not, they would not agree, all right? So, okay, well, next example, Euclidean distance. I guess I'm putting the cart before the horse as usual in here. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, all right, so Euclidean distance is defined by the absolute value function, which is the square root of the square. That's the Euclidean distance on R. The Euclidean distance on Rn, we take the square root of the sum of the squares, like a that, all right? Probably not telling you anything you haven't heard before. The Euclidean distance on complex n vectors, or just Cn, right? Standard complex column vectors, if you like. I think of my default idea is column vectors, so in terms of the linear algebra of spaces, I think of things in terms of column vectors. Not everybody does. Some analysts think in terms of row vectors, um, but, 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 they're, but they're wrong. Okay. I'm just kidding, but my advisor has written some notes that I love, but they're written in terms of row vectors. It's like, oh, I need to rewrite these. Um, anyway, um, CN, so distance from X to Y, like that. That's the Euclidean distance. Now he, here, these are the, uh, the complex, the length of the complex number, right, which you get from the square of the length of the complex number is the product of the complex number and its conjugate, which, by the way, is the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. So what this really is, is the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary components of the x1 through xn, um, you know, the, rather the first through the nth components of the complex, um, you know, vector in here. Anyway... Um, this is not in Minetti, but I feel like it belongs here, so I'm going to talk about it a little bit. And um, there we go. So V is a vector space over the reals. All right, suppose that's the case. I think you guys know what a vector space is. Then this is a norm. A norm is a function from a, the vector space. It, now, the norm, is, a norm has to be defined in a vector space, all right? So already there is a big dis difference between vec uh, uh, norm and distance. Um, the distance function we defined on an abstract set. There was no expectation of addition or anything like that. Here, a norm, we're defining it on a linear space, on a vector space. That's a, 
a huge assumption. And because of that, we can, you know, do a few other things like, well, here's the definition of the norm. It's non-negative. It's only zero if, you know, the vector we're calculating, the norm, and of course norm we could also call it the length, right? Norm is oftentimes So it's the length of what, though? It's the length of the vectors, right? So um, now, is there a connection between length and distance? Well, of course, right? That's the next page here. But um, anyway, so the, the, the norm or the length function for the vector space has to um, follow, follow this way in terms of real rescaling of a vector. So if I rescale the vector by, by c, then the absolute value of c times the length of the vector has to be the new length. So like basically, if you multiply a number times a vector, the length of that um, scalar product of x has to be the product of the magnitude of the scalar and the length of the vector um, being rescaled. And then, of course, we have the, the triangle inequality for the norm that looks like this. And um, so we call the pair V with a norm a normed linear space, or NLS, as it's sometimes abbreviated. And the thing is, if you have a normed linear space, well, that gives us tons of examples of metric spaces, actually. And the reason for that is that, and again, this particular story arc is not, it's not in this section of Minetti, um, which was what section am I in? 3.4. So I'm adding a little bit of uh, story to 3.4. And I'll, I'm, I'm going to omit just a little bit at the end of his section too, so as usual you'll gain something by reading Minetti and not just listening to me. But um, anyway, given a norm linear space, we may define the distance induced by the norm as follows. So the distance from x to y, all right, is the norm of y minus x. Ah, so for the Euclidean norm, that is, um, this is the Euclidean norm on our end, right? And that, of course, induces the Euclidean distance. And, um, but that's, you know, there's lots of ones like that. Let's see here. In contrast, ABCD or ABC of example two and example three, example three and example two respective rather, are not even vector spaces. So they're not norm linear spaces. See, not every distance function is induced from some norm, but just a special subset of the distance functions that you run into can be actually induced from a norm. All right. Um, still, example one shows that we could, in principle, put a distance function on any set we like, which is kind of trippy stuff from my perspective. But anyway, example eight, I'll just unveil the whole thing. So here I'm looking at n by n matrices. You can define the norm on an n by n matrix by the trace of a transpose a. This is a sneaky way of writing out the sum of the squares of all components of the matrix. But this is a super nice formula because then you can easily prove um, like the properties of the norm from this formula. Um, this is still called Frobenius norm on n by n matrices. And so you can define the Euclidean distance between a and b by the distance from a to b is the norm of b minus a, and it's really kind of unsurprising. If I asked students to calculate the distance between two matrices and I didn't elaborate further, there is a high probability that they would come back to me with exactly what I did in blue right here, right? It's the totally natural way to understand the distance between two matrices. Basically, you're just thinking of them both as like four component vectors stringing it out. Um, but, but there it is. So, <clears throat> excuse me. In contrast, if we use the, the distance function from example one, the distance from A to B would be one. <laughs> okay, so anyway, there is much, much more to say about inner product spaces. Um, maybe I should digress a little bit. Um, I didn't want to write it out, but um, you can study it. And um, so, well, so I haven't even written out what is an inner product. The inner product is a bilinear form from the vector space across the vector space, all right, back to the reals. And um, at least I'm going to focus on the real context. There are extensions of a lot of these ideas to the set of complex scalars, but I'm, I'm just trying to focus here on the real. And um, anyway, so given an inner product, and you can look up the careful definition, but it's a symmetric bilinear form 
um, th you can um, you may or may not be able to so the relation between the inner product and the norm is is funny like um, any inner product right um, any inner product can be um, any inner product induces a norm so like the inner product, the, so like this here is an example of that actually, um, right here. So this this is the dot product of x and x, right? So the most <coughs> excuse me, the most common inner product is the dot product in my view, and um, so this is the dot the square root of the dot product of x with itself, right? So this is actually a norm which you could view as induced from an inner product. Um, and so given an inner product, you can induce a norm, and hence you can induce a distance function, right? So inner product space is very nice. <clears throat> However, funny thing, given a norm, you may or may not be able to view that norm as being induced from an inner product, right? So that's a, that's a discussion, the, you know, the nuances there um, involve some rather, you know, really pretty identities and such, but anyway, for another day. Just wanted to mention that because the story of inner products also links into this, and I just didn't <clears throat> write too much out about that because I thought it would take me too far afield. All right, so I'm already outside of Minetti here, so let me, let me, let me focus back in here. <clears throat> All right. But of course, many spaces that you're interested in do have an inner product, and the analysis on those spaces is, in fact, married to the use of the inner product um, as it happens true for Rn. It's also true in like um, Fourier analysis where you have inner product built from like integration. <clears throat> so there are inner products that are more abstract than the ones you've seen in your regular courses. Unless you had a course in Fourier analysis and then, well, you know more. All right. But anyway, competing concept of distance for Rn. So here's a few. So for Rn, we can define the distance formula in different ways. So here's the D1 distance formula. The sum of the absolute. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. I mean, accept my fate. I gotta get a drink. <coughs> I gotta find a cup. <laughs> All right. Sorry, guys. But I think you'd rather listen to me drink than listen to me cough. So that's the d1 distance function. Then you can talk about the d sub p distance function, the sum of the pth powers of the differences between the vectors, and then the pth root of that. All right, so like you take p equals to 2, this is the Euclidean distance function, and the convention is that you just write d2 equals to d. At least, at least Minetti does that. He just uses d for the... d is the... For, for Rn, if you just write d, his default is that, <laughs> default, I'm an idiot, um, is that that's the Euclidean distance. All right, so, ooh, and then there's this thing, d infinity, which is just the max of the, the absolute, the differences, of, you know, the absolute value, the magnitude of the difference between the ith component, at i ranging from 1 to n. Um, so it's fun to contrast these notions of distance by looking at their circle. Again, this is not in Minetti, but I think this is an important thing to talk about. The circle of radius r centered at x naught for the metric space x comma d. It's the set of all points of distance r from x naught, right? It's the set of equidistant point. And of course, if you have different no notions of distance, well, then you have different circles, right? So I always point this out because um, one of the things that kind of annoys me is when like philosophers talk about the impossibility of squaring the circle because in fact it's actually really possible here it is um, I mean that's a square circle right there there's two of them in fact I, I mean the so the circle relative um, 
to the d1 distance function, it's the set of x, y such that absolute value of x plus absolute value of y equals to 1. That's the blue, the blue diamond there. That's the, the quote-unquote circle relative to the 1 distance. The circle relative to the 2 distance, of course, is what the philosophers understand, right? Um, I mean, fine, there are philosophers who understand this probably, and they're probably equally annoyed by their fellow philosopher brethren who use the squaring the circle analogy thing. Or, I don't know, probably there exists a philosopher somewhere who rejects all of these other notions of distance and says the Euclidean distance is the one and true only distance for some made-up philosopher reason. I don't know. I haven't really studied the space of all philosophers very carefully, so, you know, take what I say with a grain of salt. Anyway, so <clears throat> the infinity one, though, that's the max of the absolute values of x and 1, x and y, rather. And so if you think about that, all of these points are up here, right? Because these all have y equals to 1, so when you take the absolute value of like x and the absolute value of y, you get 1. And when x equals to 1 or x equals to minus 1 or y equal to minus 1, all of these points on the green line spit out 1 in the infinity distance. And um, so, yeah, these are all circles, right? And you can also see that you can always fit, like I could fit another Euclidean circle inside the one circle. I certainly, as you can see right here, can fit a, um, I can do what? I can definitely fit a, um, a one circle inside a two circle inside an infinity circle. Um, so anyway, of course the dis, you know, the discussion of how to compare distance is, is, is interesting and important if you're actually going to do certain analysis, right? But um, so here, here in the comparison, the, the infinity distance is less than or equal to the Euclidean distance, is less than or equal to the one distance, is less than or equal to n times the infinity distance. So let's see here. This is kind of obvious if you just think about think about it for a second. The infinity distance is the max magnitude of the difference between the components of x and y. So this, on the other hand, is the sum of the magnitudes um, of the distant uh, magnitude of the components between difference between of the components between x and y. So if you replace each difference, if you replace each one of these, right, with it, with the maximum difference between this, then you just get um, n copies of the max distance, which gives you n n times d infinity. So like deriving the last estimate here is pretty, it's pretty obvious. Um, but anyway, you can, this one, I guess the, you know, the, the, the fact that the Euclidean distance is um, bounded above by the one distance like that, um, I, I think there, you, if you square the one distance and look at the square of the, I assume if you square the Euclidean distance, and look at the square of the one distance, you'll notice that if you square the one distance, you have all of the terms in the Euclidean distance because you've got like, you know, all of the dis differences between the components squared, right? But when you multiply this, when you square this with itself, you get all of these things with p equals to 2, but you also get cross terms, all of which are positive. So, of course, you get this estimate down here that the one distance is, is bigger than the Euclidean distance, and um, you can see it in play right here on the example. If you look at the point 1, 1, what's the distance to 1, 1? Well, let's study it. It's 1 for the, the infinity metric. Um, it's the square root of 2, of course, for the Euclidean distance from the origin of 1, 1 is square root of 2. That's what we're used to, right? Um, the 1 distance from here to here is the absolute value of 1 plus the absolute value of 1, right? Because we're talking about distance from the origin, you know, um, and so that's the square root of, uh, it's rather just 2 is the 1 distance, right? And, and of course that is in fact equal to 2 times 1. So we, we see all of this in play if we just look at the point 1, 1 for an example. All right, let me move on here. Yeah. All right. So the standard bound. Given any metric space, all right, We can define a new metric by taking the minimum of one 
and the distance between the points of the original map, the original given metric. So this is called d-bar, it's called the standard bound. And here's the proof that it is in fact a metric. So like symmetry follows, um, well not symmetry, excuse me, the thing which has no name. <laughs> so the fact that the distance from a point to itself is zero. Um, by the way, if you have a, if you have a beloved name for this, um, feel free to leave it in the comments. Ahem. Anyway, um, so the distance from x, d bar from x to x is the minimum of 1 and dxx, but dxx is 1 by assumption because d is a metric and therefore a minimum 1, 0, 0, so we got that one. The symmetry follows similarly um, because excuse me, the non-negativity follows similarly because, of course, one, the minimum of one and a non-negative number is not negative. Um, the symmetry follows, again, from the symmetry of D. The symmetry of D bar follows from symmetry of D because I can flip this to that, which then, by definition, is D bar YX. The triangle inequality, um, there's two cases to consider, but it's not bad. Let's walk through it here. So, uh, I took the time to write it out. I'm going to take the time to talk through it. <laughs> so here we go. Um, suppose you have x, y, and z in the space. If you consider the distance d bar x, y, x, z plus the dis d bar z, y, if that's greater than or equal to 1, right, then since the distance from x to y, d bar from x to y, is less than or equal to 1 by construction, we have that d bar x, y is less than or equal to 1, which is less than or equal to the sum of the distances from x to z and y to z in the d bar metric. So, in other words, we get triangle inequality under the assumption that the sum of the distances is greater than or equal to 1. So what's left to consider is if the sum of the distance is less than or equal to less than 1, rather. All right, so if this is less than 1, it means the, that both the distance from x to z and the distance from z to y in the, in the d bar is less than 1, which forces them... Um, to be what? Um, that means that when you take the minimum of the distance from x to y and 1, you're going to get the distance from x to y, x to, excuse me, when you take the distance from x to z, um, or if you take the distance from z to y, they're both less than 1, which means that that must be that um, that d bar is equal to the distance from x to z, or d bar of z y is equal to the distance from z to y by definition, right? Because it, it, can't, it can't be that they're equal to 1, because then you wouldn't satisfy this, right? All right. So, nothing profound there. If you didn't follow it, I'm just using the definition of d-bar. Hence, the distance from x, but we'll also notice by the regular, by the assumption that d itself is a metric, we have the triangle inequality, but that is exactly that triangle inequality in d-bar since this and that are equal to this and that. All right, so there you have it. The standard bound is in fact defining yet another metric on a given space with a given metric. All right, and um, Minetti puts this off till the end of the section, but I think it's useful to do right here. So definition x, d, a metric space, then a subset a of x is bounded if there exists a real number such that the distance from A to B is less than or equal to that real number M for all A, B, and A, and you can also talk about a map being bounded um, if the image of its domain is bounded. All right. So for example, um, for example here, the plane R2 is not bounded by the Euclidean metric, right? Um, if you take the whole plane, you can't you know, find a upper bound to the distance between two points, right? You can have two points can be far separated as you want. But if you use the standard bound metric on the plane, then the distance between two, any po between two points is at most one, right? So the standard bound is interesting. It's like you're just cutting off distances more than one. You're just like, I'm not interested. <laughs> you're like, uh, you know, we, we live 10 miles apart. No, you don't. You're, you're a mile apart. Everybody who's more than certain distance just gets redefined to be distance one. Um, just kind of, it's a, it's, a, it's a weird truncation of uh, the notion of large scale distances, this thing. Um, but anyway, um, R2 
Again, R2 with the Euclidean metric is unbounded, but R2 with the standard bound metric is bounded. Um, so, in fact, I think every set, <laughs> if you start thinking about it, I believe every subset of a space is bounded in the standard bound metric because you can always use one as a bound if you're using the standard bound metric. Um, so, yeah. Now, um, I should metric, I should, I should metric, listen, I should mention the concept of a bound is not technically a, um, a topological idea because you could study you could study two different metrics on a given space that would, as we'll soon discuss, produce the same topology, and yet that set could be bounded in one um, one metric, but it could be unbounded in the other metric. So the concept of boundedness is a that's a, an idea from from the concept. It's an idea from the world of metric spaces. It's not a topological not a topological idea, although it has its use in topology. Um, sort of like distance is not a vector space concept, right? But certainly distance has its uses in vector spaces. Well, um, anyway, so an extreme example of that would be like Gilbert Strang's linear algebra book where he gives many um, analytic geometric proofs of <laughs> linear algebraic theorems. Um, so to the algebraist, to the algebraist, that is kind of like horrific because those, you know, theorems in linear algebra can be proved without use of the Euclidean concept of distance or inner product or any of that, and um, <laughs> and yet and yet he does. So um, because it's there to use, right? If you're if you're working with column vectors, you can fall back and use the Euclidean you know, Pythagorean formula and stuff to do things. It's just often not done in linear algebra these days because people try to take a an algebraic approach so that the arguments you give will still make sense over other characteristics and things like that. All right, anyway, here we go. Finally to the topology. <laughs> Half hour into this. So let x comma d be a metric space, then the ball um, of open ball rather of radius r centered at x is defined like so. It's the set of all points that are at most distance r from the center point x. So the difference between this and the circle, like the circle I was talking about a second ago had equality here, right? So the circles that I was, was talking about would be sort of right outside the ball, if you want to think of it that way. Um, all right. So a definition and also a theorem. <laughs> so <laughs> it's one of those, oh, wait a minute, so we're doing that. Yeah, we're kind of doing that. So we're, it's a theorem, but also we're making a definition. Um, so of course, if you're a purist, you can separate these into stating a theorem and then defining it afterwards if you want. But anyway, I'm going to do it together. Um, so let X D be a metric space. The topology induced by D is called the metric topology. In particular, a subset A of X is defined to be open in the metric topology if for any x and a, there exists an r greater than zero, such that the ball of the open ball of radius r centered at x is in fact a subset of a. This is exactly the so in like Euclidean topology, we use this definition of open early on, often, and in like my elementary discussions of topology, I'll say a subset of R n is open if every point is an interior point. What does it mean to be an interior point? An interior point is one for which there exists an open ball or containing the point inside the set, you know? So this is really saying that A is open if every point is interior. It's just now we're using, you know, arbitrary open balls as defined by an abstract metric on a space. All right. So um, I was following the proof from Minetti and I got fished in like, every so often, Minetti has a sentence in the proof, which I don't really think belongs there. And this is one of those cases, so uh, we just kind of work through it here with you. It's not wrong. I mean, it's almost, I don't, I can't, I, you ask me where Minetti's wrong, I don't remember. Um, <laughs> I think he's pretty much right, but um, whenever I'm confused in Minetti, Minetti, I have found out what it is, is I just need to keep reading. You know, he says something, I'm like, he hasn't proved that. 
and then, what? What's going on? What's going on? And then after about a paragraph, I realize, oh, so the thing at the start of the paragraph is proved by everything afterwards. Ah, duh. So be patient. Um, anyway, so I need to prove. I can't just call it the metric topology. You know, just because you call something a topology doesn't make it so, um, right? So why is this? So this is this the underlined thing in green. That's the definition. Yeah. This defines, allegedly, the topology on a metric space. Let's see why it works. So first of all, the empty set is open by default, right? Because every point is interior in the empty set, yeah. Um, also, this, this sentence right here is interesting, um, but, oh, fine, I'll read it. For each x in x, um, the distance is zero, right? That means that the, since the distance from x to x is zero, that's less than r, right, for any positive r, which means that x is always an element of the ball of radius r centered at x. This, is, this should probably be elevated to a lemma. This is actually used over and over and over again in this section. It's very important to understand this. This is foundational, that the ball centered at x of radius r contains x. That's like very crucial to many things, many, many thoughts. Um, for example, if you notice x is the element of the ball of radius 1 centered at x, for all, you can do that for every x in the space, that means that the space x is what? It's a union um, of these open balls, right? So that, so he says he's, he, in this proof in Minetti, he says he's using, he's checking axioms 1, 2, and 3, it doesn't seem to me that this, what's circled in red here, is relevant to that. This sentence right here is useful towards proving that, in fact, the, um, the set of open balls forms a... This is part of what you need for the set of open balls to form a topological basis with respect to this definition of topology. Um, well, anyway, let me move on. So a, how about axiom 2? Um, can we get... But it's kind of related. I think the part of the reason that sentence is there is it does feed in to what I'm about to say, so, you know, fine. <clears throat> So, let x not be an x, right? Then, <clears throat> then the ball of radius 1 centered at x naught is a subset of x. Therefore, x naught is an interior point. x naught was arbitrary point in x naught rather than x. Therefore, this shows that x is open in the metric topology. So, axiom 1, we've got the empty set and the whole space are in the topology, all right? Um, let a sub i be a... Let me cover up this down here. Um, so, if we have a collection of open sets, right, and we let x be an element of that collection, I'd like to show that that's an interior point, right? Um, so if x is an element of the union, that means there exists a j for which x is an element of a sub j, but since a sub j was assumed to be open, that means there exists an r such that that ball um, centered at x of radius r is a subset of a j, but of course a sub j is a subset of the union, Right? Any so any if you take a union of a bunch of sets, any any set which is being union is a subset of that total union. And as such, we've shown that there is a ball of radius r around x, right, which is contained in the union. But that x was an arbitrary element of the union, and that shows that every point in this union is in fact an interior point, which is to say that the union of open sets is open. And this was an arbitrary union, so that's axiom two. Axiom three, <laughs> although I've labeled it number four, point number four, all right. But this is axiom, we're looking at the uh, finite intersection property for the um, alleged metric topology. It's currently under review um, until this proof is done. So suppose A and B are open. Suppose X is a point in the intersection. That means X is in A and X in is B, X is in B. They're both open. That means there exists an A radius and a B radius such that the uh, ball of radius A is, is a subset of A and the ball of radius B is a subset of B. If you take R to be the minimum of the A radius and the B radius, then it's easy to see that the ball of radius R is a subset of the A, the A ball, and it's a, the ball of radius R is a subset of the B ball, and as such, it's a subset of... And, and by the way, this is a subset of A, and that's a subset of B, which means that the ball of radius R is a subset of both A and B, hence the ball of radius R is a subset of A intersect B. All right, so this 
the proof given in four is pretty much identical to the proof that you may or may not have seen in like Euclidean space. It's just there you're actually looking at, um, you know, actual distance as opposed to the sort of abstract distance. But anyway, there, there you go. That proves that the topology defined by the underlining in green here is in fact a topology that satisfies axioms one, two, and three. And as such, we can refer to it as the metric topology and not be out of line. It is in fact a topology in the sense we've defined. And when is, it, when is a set open? A set is open if every point is interior. When is a point interior? Although I haven't written that down in these notes, every point is interior if there exists an open ball with respect to the metric centered around the point inside the set. So if there exists a open ball in the D metric uh, containing the point within the set, it's an interior point of said set, set. Remark. Rn, Cn, with the topology induced from the Euclidean metric, are said to carry the Euclidean topology. And typically, this is the default topology, which we use unless an application warrants a different choice of topology. All right, so here's the dilemma. My phone is going nuts. I need to go check and make sure I'm not missing something. Sorry, guys. push notification from an app is interrupting my lecture. That is aggravating. All right, so lemma 3.44 from Minetti again. Um, the for the topology induced from a distance function on x, open balls are open. Well, that's good. Um, a subset of A is open if and only if it is the union of open balls. All right, so if you put that together with the uh, covering thing I had on the last page that the union of all open balls, excuse me, that the entirety of the space is a union of open balls, um, then you look at it, you've got both of the necessary components for the set of all open balls in a metric space forming a so-called topological basis for the metric topology. Um, and then U of subset of X is a neighborhood of a point X, if and only if um, U contains an open ball centered at X, right, which is to say that it's an interior point, right? That there exists a open ball which is centered at X containing you. All right, so here's the proof of all that, or at least part of it. I didn't prove three. I'll let you read that one. Um, so if we have X, if we have X in the ball um, centered at X not of radius R, and we let S be R minus the distance from X to X naught, all right? Well, that's by construction positive, all right? So we wish to show that this ball of radius S centered at X is a subset of the ball of radius R centered at X naught because that would then prove one, right? So that would show that inside this, op this, inside this open ball, so named, okay, um, you had to remember that the name of it was open ball, which is just because you call an open ball open, does it make it open is the question we're asking right now. Um, so, um, yeah. But what that means is I need to show each point of the open ball is in fact an interior point, which is to say that each point in the open ball contains a open ball around the point, and that's what we're doing. Here the open ball is going to be the ball of radius S centered at the arbitrary point X, all right? And um, so, all right, so we're trying to show that this is a subset of that. So to show something's a subset of something else, pick a point in it, right? Z, an element of B of X, S. Notice that the distance from X naught to Z by the triangle inequality is less than or equal to the distance from X naught to X plus the distance from X to Z. But by construction, the distance from X to Z is, um, at most, um, at most s. All right, that's just the definition of the ball of radius s centered at x, right? This is the set of all z such that the distance from x to z is less than s. 
So I just use the definition of the open ball radius s here. But then um, this right here, going back to that, um, is is equal to r, right? So the distance of x comma x naught plus s is equal to r. Um, if I had this picture blown up a little bit, you can't even kind of see it. But anyway, there's that. So what that says is that, of course, that the distance from x naught to z is less than r, because this is a strict inequality right there. And that means that z is an element of the ball of radius r centered at x naught. z was an arbitrary point in this ball, which means that the ball of radius s centered at x is a subset of the ball of radius x not centered at r, which then proves that the point x was interior. <laughs> All right. Trust me, Minetti has, has written less, and maybe, I don't know, if you think I write too much, read Minetti. <laughs> there you go. Um, so here we go. I mean, I probably write too much, but this here, two, um, I'm trying to prove that A is open if and only if it's a union of open balls. Suppose I have an open set, all right, then for each x in A, there exists a radius relative to that x, such that the ball centered at x of radius x is a subset of A. If I just take the union over A, over x in A of the singleton x, that's equal to A, like, obviously. And um, as each x is in the ball of radius x centered at r, uh, ball of radius rx centered at x, you then have the, the, of course, each one of those balls is a subset of A, which means that the union of all subsets is so if you take the union of things which are subsets of a given set, then the union of those subsets is still a subset of A. And, all right, so then it, it follows then that a is in fact equal to the union of the balls of, of radius rx centered at x. All right. Um, there may be a small gap in this sentence or something, but I'm I'm tired of <laughs> tired of this one. The converse direction is clear since a is a union of open balls, which means that each point in a is contained in an open ball. All right, and that makes that point interior. All right. So, of course, the union of open balls is open, essentially by definition, right? But, so the one direction of that proof is essentially the definition of the, the metric topology. Um, so, anyway. Moving along here. Oh, goodness gracious. So, let x, d be a metric space, and let c be the set X, x prime and x such that the distance from x naught to x prime is less than or equal to r, right? Um, so I think this would technically be like the union of, this, of the r circle centered at x naught with the ball of radius r centered at x naught. If you wanted my notation, this would be the union of the circle I defined earlier and the ball we were just talking about. Anyway, this is a closed set in the metric topology. For any x naught and any positive r. So here's the proof. Um, and um, so here we go. Let x naught be an x, and suppose. Let me zoom in just a bit here. So take a point in x, and suppose you've got radius r greater than zero. Consider a point outside of x, I mean outside of c, right? Our goal, of course, is to show that this is an open set, right? So we'd like to show that this point x, which is an arbitrary point in the complement of c, we'd like to show that x is an interior point, all right? To do that, I need to find an open ball centered around, centered at x, which is contained in the complement. All right, so I'm going to set delta equal to the distance from x to x naught minus r. So that's kind of this picture in mind. Um, now, okay, so that is by construction positive, and um, if x is not an element of c, that means that, of course, the distance from x to x naught must be greater than r, right? Because c, just to bring it back into the picture here, was defined to be the set of points that are at most 
uh, well, excuse me, they're less than or equal to distance r from x naught, right? Um, uh, if I'm talking about the one centered at x naught. Okay, so this c could use like an x sub naught notation to be more honest, <laughs> okay, because c depends on x naught. But anyway, uh, as is commonly the case in math, we don't write down all of the dependence in all of the notation because otherwise it would get really, really cluttered. Okay. Um, all right, so, 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 so. We have... Um, x is not an element of c by assumption, which means that the distance from x to x naught is greater than r. Suppose you have y in the ball of radius delta centered at x, right? Um, then by the triangle inequality, we, distance from x naught to x is less than the distance from x naught to y plus the distance from y to x, great. Thus, scroll up a bit here, thus, by the triangle inequality we have this, which then rearranging gives me the distance from x naught to y is greater than or equal to the distance of x naught to x minus the distance from x to y. But remember, by I have to scroll back. <laughs> I should just leave it. Anyway, so right here, if we solve this for the distance from x to x naught, we get delta plus r, right? So I get the delta plus r down here. And um, for that, minus d. But then notice this, that since y is an element of the ball of radius x centered at delta, um, which was assumed at the outset, right, here. So since we know that, that means the distance from x to y is less than delta. But multiplying by minus 1, we get minus distance is less is greater than minus delta, which means I can replace minus distance from x to y with minus delta and make the expression larger. The deltas cancel, we get r, so we have the distance from x naught to y is, is strictly greater than r, which means what? That means that this point y is outside of the circle, right? It's out, I mean, it's outside of the disk. I, I should really call this a disk of radius r centered at x naught, right? It's the disk of radius r centered at x naught. Um, and so y is not an element of C, which means that y is an element of the complement of C. Therefore, the ball, right, let me scooch up a bit here. Therefore, since y is an element of the complement, that means that we just showed that this, we, we picked an arbitrary point. I can't get it all, let me, I'll have to zoom back out again, I'm an idiot. So we picked an arbitrary point in this ball of radius delta centered at x, right? And we've just shown that that, that arbitrary point is an element of the complement, which shows that the ball is a subset of the complement. <clears throat> but x, remember, was an arbitrary point in the complement. So we've just shown that an arbitrary point in the complement of C is in fact an interior point because it's got an open ball centered around it, and therefore x minus C is open, which proves that C is closed. <sighs> All right, so anyway, there's the, the gory details that, in fact, the, 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 the disk, the natural abstraction of the disk, is still closed in the metric topology. Uh, let's see here. This is an example. I've been, it's, you know, it's been a minute since I wrote this. Let me read through it with you. Let's see what it says. So consider the example one distance function, right? If you look at the closed uh, disk, centered at x not there, it's everything. <laughs> so so the, the unit disk <laughs> relative to the example one metric, it's every point in the space. <laughs> it's so stupid. On the other hand, if you look at the ball of radius a half, right, or you could look at the ball of radius one, you don't have to put a half here, you could put a one here, it'd be the same story, right? It's just the singleton containing x. Um, so what this means is that the singletons are open in this example one metric topology. And so what that means is that, I mean, it means a lot of things. The union of, so any subset can be obtained from the union of singletons. So this means that every subset of X is open, but every subset is the complement of another subset. So every set is also closed. So every set is both open and closed in the topology defined by example one. You might recognize this. This is the discrete topology, 
right? Um, so every yeah every subset X is both open and closed in its metrics topology. In fact, it is the it is the discrete topology. But there's something else to say here. The closure of the of the unit ball right um, is not equal to the unit disk actually here because the closure of the unit ball is the intersection of all closed sets containing the unit ball um, and that's just the singleton right in contrast the unit disk as we just discussed is the whole space so you see there's a distinction between the unit disk idea and the abstract topological closure idea and that might be a little bit surprising because of course in the metric in the usual Euclidean context there is no difference between these two things right like the the closure um, in the abstract topological sense and the um, you know closed disks they're, they're sympathical all right moving along I got a test I got to give today. I can't be talking too long here. I'm running out of time. Um, oh well. So, um, here's the old epsilon delta criteria. If we have a function from one metric space to another, then f is continuous at x if and only if for any um, epsilon greater than zero there exists a delta greater than zero such that whenever the distance from f of x to f of y is less than epsilon well, excuse me, the distance from f of x to f of y is less than epsilon whenever we have the distance from x to y is less than delta or we could rewrite this if the distance from x to y is less than delta implies the distance from f of x to f of y is less than epsilon I prefer that language I, I don't I do not like this whenever language but anyway alright so proof if f is continuous then the inverse image of open sets is open I, I think Technically, I should say, we're talking about continuity of point, so what we need is that the inverse image of, um, well, anyway, let me just read the proof here. Sorry, guys, I should have turned the air conditioning on. It's starting to get hot. Um, the inverse image of open sets is open. So, um, see, I'm talking about ah, curses. F is continuous at X. I say, I've forgotten what our definition of continuous at a point is. Sorry, this is bothering me now. I can't. I have to go back to the continuous section here. How did we define continuity at a point in a topological space? Do you guys remember? It occurs to me I don't remember right offhand. I think it was in terms of a neighborhood. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Definition 3.27. Um, right here, right? Uh, map between two topological spaces is continuous at A point x of x if for any neighborhood u of f of x there is a neighborhood v of x such that f of v is a subset of u all right so basically it's just the uh the inverse image criteria done locally but um so i don't think i'm going to violate that definition in what i prove here so let's just go on um, let epsilon be greater than zero then if we look at um well i guess that there's just an extra Well, let me shut up. So um, the ball of radius epsilon centered at f of x is this guy. That's an open set in y. Um, and it is a neighborhood, right? It's a neighborhood of f of x. So since that's the case, the inverse image has to be open, right, in x. But what's that mean? All right. Well, that means, I mean, that's by assumption of continuity at the point, right? So... Come on, behave. F of x is an element of the ball of radius epsilon centered at f of x, so that means that x is an element of the inverse image of that ball. Okay, so then what? So there exists a delta such that the ball of radius delta centered at x is a subset of that, because this is, this is an open set, right? Um, the inverse image of the ball of radius epsilon of f of x is an open set in x. x is a point in that set. Therefore, there exists an open ball of radius delta. Right? In other words, x has to be interior, so there exists